Good evening, everybody. Uh, wanted to welcome you to this uh, special Dallas Morning News rewards event tonight. Uh, we will be talking about the Cowboys specifically and the NFL draft. So again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, wanted to introduce myself. My name is David Moore. I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, I'm not sure I'll be very good at it, but I think when you see what the options were with the other three panelists, uh, I probably couldn't do any worse. So please keep that in mind as we go along. Uh, I will introduce the three of them shortly. Uh, just to give you a little bit idea about the format tonight. Um, I'll, after everyone has a chance to introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit, I think we'll just launch right into a discussion. And uh, this will be uh, the uh, a lot of the topics many of you talked about uh, coming up. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, we'll spend 20, 25 minutes on that. Then I think we'll move from there and we'll go to uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, I know some of you are putting your questions in the chat. Uh, I already see some of them here. So we'll get to those as we go along. Uh, then we'll end with a mock draft and we'll go... Uh, the four of us will quickly go through uh, those first nine picks, what we think uh, could happen there. And we haven't done this leading in. So uh, one of these uh, uh, contrarians could throw in a pick that could uh, make for an interesting conversation on what the Cowboys will do at number 10. But, but it will follow uh, what, what the you know, conventional wisdom is out there as far as how this draft is is shaping up ahead of the Cowboys. And, and once we do that, uh, the four of us will talk <coughs> about, uh, who we believe that pick will be, uh, give our reasons, and then we'll end it with, uh, there will be one of the participants uh, who is joining us tonight will receive an autographed jersey from Dak Prescott. So that will be announced at the end of this. Uh, I, I think from here, we'll just, we'll just go into this. As I said, my name is David Moore. Uh, I cover the Dallas Cowboys. Um, I started actually during the Tom Landry days, so that goes back a while. Uh, not continuously, but have uh, been dropped in on several occasions. I uh, have been Cowboys specifically here for the last 12 to 14 years. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce is someone who's been with the Cowboys even more. In fact, I believe he was there when the team was awarded in 1960 or 1959. And when they started playing 1960, that is Tim Callishaw. Tim, can you uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Tim, you're muted. This I set things up. My, my name is Tim Callishaw. I'm the lead sports columnist for the <laughs> Dallas Morning News. Have been for 23 years. So technically I'm not David's boss, although I'm over him. Um, so we'll be chatting later about that interview. Over you, but please go Actually, ahead. Actually, being truthful for a moment, David and I, as David knows, started on the Cowboys beat the same summer of 1986 uh, when, when it all fell apart. With 20 <laughs> years of consecutive winning seasons stopped uh, abruptly. And it took them a while to recover. And by the time they recovered, Tom and Tex and Gil were gone. <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, that's enough about me, other than I've been assigned the fourth and eighth picks in tonight's draft, and I might, I might be lengthy in what I have to say about Atlanta and Carolina. I've done a lot of research there, but I, I guess we'll just move this along, and I will uh, shift gears to the more uh, uh, serious but uh, uh, the brainier side of this group, and that would be Michael Gelkin who uh, came here via the Raiders. I don't know what we had to give up to the Raiders to get him, but we're glad he's here. I'm really a glorified intern relative to your guys' experience level. He's in 1986. <laughs> I was born in 87. So just for some perspective. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to okay. start. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been covering the Cowboys since the final breath of the Jason Garrett era. I was there for his final <laughs> season. I started covering the Chargers in the final season of North Turner. And so I've got a real touch with this thing. Uh, I cover the Chargers, I cover the Raiders. Uh, so apparently the Cowboys are due for some relocation out of the Dallas area. I'm sorry to break that news, but that, uh, that's what you get with me. <laughs> These teams are on the move. Always on the move. 
And we do have- Do some, we have our other morning news contributor? Well, he should be joining us here soon. Uh, suppose see him. Alvin Watkins will join us. He is having internet problems at the moment. <coughs> I would argue his problems go well beyond the internet, but uh, at least that is the problem he is using to not be on the call at the moment. I'm uh, guessing he shows up momentarily, but- But when he does, you're, oh, oh well. Yes, yes. And, uh, he likes uh, to wait, he's like a boxer, the boxing champion. He comes into the ring last. And, and he waits through all the, the hoopla, there that, he is. All the booze. He no, covered the Jets, so he has a lot of expertise in covering the top half <clears throat> where the Cowboys are this year. So, Calvin, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves that myself, Tim, and Michael weren't able to fill everybody in? No, no tell us everything. Start it with Robert Morris <laughs> and leave nothing out. Uh, I, I will say briefly, uh, since I'm late, that this is my second tenure at the Dallas Morning News. I started in 2000. Uh, before that, You're not wrong right there. My, <laughs> before that, uh, I was at another publication, uh, the West of Us, and um, went to Coppin State College. I'm originally from New York and all that jazz. Um, I left the morning news to go to another media entity, and um, then I left there. Well, they kicked me out, and then I worked at Newsday for a year. Uh, the athletic and now I'm back here at the morning news. This is this will be my uh uh 12th year on the Cowboys beat. I think. 12 or 13, something like that. And I can assure everyone if if Calvin's internet does drop off before this call is <laughs> over, he will not keep the sign Dak Prescott journey. We, we'll will, get we will make sure that that is announced and someone will receive that. And we'll be in contact with you after the event's over by email uh, to, to schedule how to, how to get that jersey to you. But uh, let's just go right into this. And, you know, today at the Star, the, the Cowboys had a press conference. Um, every team has to meet with the media once leading up to the draft. The Cowboys traditionally do it on Tuesday, two days before the draft. Um, you know, no revelations, no, um, certainly no one discloses what they're going to do, but, it, but you can get some bread crumb, bread crumbs. I think you can pick up on some clues here and there, and there, there's some tidbits. And um, today I thought it was interesting, and, and people have talked about this before. It was, you know, best player available versus need. The Cowboys' needs are clearly on the defensive side of the ball. But the shiniest, brightest object out there, who is unlikely to get to 10, but if he did, what would the Cowboys do is Kyle Pitts, uh, the, the Florida tight end. And Jerry spoke about that today. And, and Calvin, why don't, why don't we start with you, just what um, Jerry was saying about that and, and a, a little bit more about the possibility or the improbability of Kyle Pitts being there at number 10 and what that means. And I guess Calvin froze. So Michael, you were there today and you're not frozen. So let's go to you. Sure, I think Calvin unfroze. He just doesn't want to participate in the chat. Well, just... I, well, David froze and I was shaking my head like this. So I didn't know <clears throat> if he froze, but I guess I froze. Answer the question, Calvin. Kyle Pitts. Just answer please. the question. Uh, I, I, I would say Kyle Pitts, yeah, that's the guy they should draft if he's available. Um, however, as David mentioned, there are a lot of needs on this team especially on defense in the secondary. Um, you know, I, I would have to admit that Jerry Jones today did kind of surprise me uh, when Chris Mortensen of ESPN was the first to report that Jerry was infatuated with Kyle Pitts. And it seems as if today Jerry kind of tried to downplay it a little bit, but I think Kyle Pitts is their guy if he's there at 10. However, you can't ignore the fact that they got two other cornerbacks that are highly regarded. Michael, what, what did you take out of what Jerry said today? And, and, and yeah, Jerry had infatuation and put it in the context of, well, who is not interested in Kyle Pitts to try to diffuse it that way? Uh, but, but anything else you took from what he said today on, on the topic? Yeah, I think we've collectively exhausted a lot of breath on Kyle Pitts to the Cowboys in terms of could the Cowboys trade up to get Kyle Pitts? And that was one thing Jerry essentially dismissed today. He said it was a bit of a distortion uh, with the word he used. 
to characterize his infatuation as being this over the top driver of as if the Cowboys might make a move on Thursday night from the number 10 pick to somewhere up into the range where they could select Kyle Pitts. That is not what the Cowboys are looking to do. That was about as definitive, I think, as a, a general manager or an executive or whatever representative of the team is speaking before the draft at, at one of these annual news conferences, uh, as, as definitive as, as you could probably hear in terms of something that isn't going to happen. So um, if the Cowboys, you know, are on the clock and Kyle Pitts, again, I don't really, really, really don't think he's going to be there at 10. Uh, but if he theoretically was, you probably don't want him going to 11 uh, because you got the Giants and you got the Eagles right behind you. So if you're thinking the Cowboys – need to take care of their defense well keeping Kyle Pitts out of the NFC East might be a good place to start and so maybe you trade back if not selecting him, uh, selecting Kyle Pitts yourself but I really think the Cowboys are gonna draft a fine player on Thursday and his name will not be Kyle Pitts. Cam you love to move and shake you like to tell people you love to move and shake I'm not sure mm -hmm. that fits your personality mm -hmm. but would you consider moving up at all? Do you think that is problematic and does it make sense, even though I many consider Pitts a, a <coughs> sort of player? Yeah, I would, I would consider it. And, and I wrote about it, as you, as you noted. Thank you for reading the Jimmy Johnson draft chart and all that, which says you could trade the Cowboys' 10th pick and your second round pick and get all the way to five. Now you would have to have a willing taker there. And, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense to do that. Um, but a quarterback goes in the fourth spot, whether it's to Atlanta or not. Um, uh, Cincinnati's fifth, and they take the offensive tackle from Oregon. Miami's sixth, and they take a wide receiver, which is what they need. Miami has a very good young tight end. So now he's at seven, and he's sliding there. If it's only moving up two or three picks, then I think they would have to think about what the cost of that is, and not just the cost in draft picks, but the cost in – in having to wait quite a while before you add to that defense. And even though you don't want to, you don't want to neglect the defense. If Kyle Pitts is really better at his position than just about all these other people being drafted after maybe Trevor Lawrence uh, are, then, then I think that's okay. Uh, more than okay to go get him. And even though we think of this team being very good on offense, Two years ago when they had their team together, you remember all those games they lost, New England, New Orleans, they couldn't score against all those in all the big games. So that if you had a guy who is considered to be that kind of a weapon playing with Lamb and Cooper and Gallup, and maybe you're free to move one of those receivers next year, I, I think that would be a very good – I think that would be a good thing to do if you're not, if you're not moving up to where it costs you – your second round pick. If you're, if it costs you your second round pick, but you're getting back a third or something like that and you're getting him. And as Michael said, keeping him out of Philadelphia, which last year they kept CD lamb, whether they wanted to or not out of Philadelphia and Philadelphia got a receiver from TCU is not as good. Uh, then, then I think that's a hell of a thing to do. And that's, let's move there. Now we talked about moving up and now let's talk about moving back because um, one of the, uh, you, you always get so much speculation at this time. And one of it is, okay, either four or five quarterbacks are going to go in the top 10, which is unusual. That I don't think five quarterbacks has ever, have ever gone in the top 10. Well, now say the Cowboys are sitting there at 10, four quarterbacks have gone and teams see the possibility of jumping up to number 10 to get a quarterback, knowing that if you get off that plateau, uh, it, there's a serious drop off in talent. You're not going to feel good about moving up to get any other quarterback, really. Uh, so now, one that has gotten traction is what a New England at number 15, who certainly has a need for a quarterback going forward. What if the quarterback they like or a quarterback is there at 10? Would it make sense for Dallas to move back, you know, five spots to number 15 and see what they could get out of New England to do that? Now let's start that conversation and let me also preface it by saying this is unusual and that you have two division foes right behind you in the draft <laughs> uh, with the New York Giants and Philadelphia. So if you're giving up at 10, you're letting two division rivals potentially take, probably you're going to take two players you really like off the board before you pick. Uh, Tim, let's go ahead and start with you on this one because I know you have strong thoughts here. 
Yeah, you and I discussed this a little on our, our short-lived radio show, which I'd like to tell our readers tomorrow night is our final appearance. Not your final, but my final appearance with you on the ticket from seven to eight. Um, and you, you were more cautious about this than me, but if you want to move down five spots from 10 to 15 and you get New England's pick, and in theory, you probably get New England's number one next year. That is, that is the prize you get with that, which I think is worth getting no matter where that pick is. You need, to, you need to have both the cornerbacks left, Patrick Sertan and J.C. Horn, and at least one of the offensive linemen, Rashawn Slater, and probably one more player that you like enough that you would say, you know, you wouldn't take him at 10, but you wouldn't hate having him at 10. So that if you've got four of those guys floating out there uh, and, and you catch any kind of break and not, not all four of them go, which is unlikely, then you're going to get one of those four guys at 15. And if, and if, and if New England is interested in coming up to do that, I'm, I'm not against that. I'm, I'm not, I'm not in love with that. If it turns into an offensive lineman, I think they're much better off drafting a quarterback, uh, both for need, mainly for need. Um, but I, if it's, if, if there's a nice prize at the other end, then I can see doing it. If there's four guys that you like. Calvin, what do you think about that? And, and really, next time Tim goes on that long, feel free to just jump in and interrupt him. No, you too, Michael. We need to. We have some kind of time restriction here. <laughs> uh, I'm not in favor of trading down. If, if, you, if you're at number 10, get your guy. You know, uh, let's not stop messing around here. Get your, get your guy. But say they do trade down, you got to figure out will the Giants take a corner? It looks as if they want a lineman, it's an offensive or defensive lineman. Philly, they're at 12. They could get a receiver. Um, maybe they mess you up. As Michael pointed out, those are two division rivals who could mess up your plans and still maybe get Patrick Sertain or J.C. Horn. And then you got the Chargers in Minnesota for New England. So does the great Mike Zimmer, does he mess up Jerry's thoughts to get a corner? Do the Chargers get an offensive lineman? Do the Chargers get a corner? So... To me, I would have to weigh those options, especially if I'm going to 15 and, and I think that I'm going to get my corner or maybe Rashawn Slater, the tackle from Northwestern, uh, Micah Parsons, linebacker for Penn State. Maybe you get him at 15 if, if you think he's going to be there. But, um, but I, I think you just stay where you are at 10 and get your guy. Michael, how, how, many, how many players – in your mind, would the Cowboys have to have on that plateau at 10 for them to make the decision, okay, we'll move back to 15 and feel good about it? And do you see any way moving back beyond, say, 15? Or, or is that really kind of the outer limits of what you would even be willing to consider uh, with where you are at number 10? Yeah, if you're going to trade back, you need to be certain that a player that you love will be available. So say it was five spots. You need to be certain that let's say the Cowboys are targeting corner, that, you know, what do they think about Newsom? What do they think about Caleb Farley's back situation? Are they comfortable with that? You know, if they're, if they're comfortable with, you know, what would we in the public see as a drop off, they think it's far less of one and they'd be comfortable with, you know, picking up a say a day two draft pick uh, that potentially could further weaponize them to maybe move up in day two because of now what would be 11 picks instead of their current grouping of 10. Um, I could perhaps see that, but it's really got to be their draft board telling them that they're comfortable and, uh, and assured that a player they love would be available at their new spot. And I just don't know without knowing, obviously, the intricacies of the Cowboys draft board, if that's something that they would seriously consider. Or if they are set at corner and they have uh, Pat Sertain, the second available at number 10 overall, uh, and, and you feel like there's a real drop off there uh, because he is the most scheme versatile cornerback in this draft. He's the most technical. Uh, he brings a lot of components that the others don't, uh, certainly the most productive, uh, then you just stay put, take your guy. Yeah, and, and I, I could just summarize my thoughts real quick before David <laughs> goes on. If you could, please. Calvin, <laughs> Calvin said it correctly. I mean, I said about right. why you could do it, but if you're at 10 and you think you're a better team than that and you shouldn't be drafted that high, you ought to take somebody at 10. You, you shouldn't try to get cute and go to 15. That's not, that's not ideal. That's something you understand if they get another number one out of it, but it is getting a little cute 
and letting the Giants and Eagles dictate who you get. There, I'm done. And we're going to do um, good. I, I think we can all say good to that. Um, you know, we can conclude this before we get to Q&A in a little bit here uh, with uh, a longer discussion about Sertan and uh, J.C. Horn, because uh, uh, there's a good chance uh, certainly one or both will be there. And what do you do in that decision? But let, let's take them off the board for a second. Um, who else say both are gone, which it's difficult to envision a scenario where that happens. Well, let's just take both off the board. What other players would you consider at number 10? And let's start with our draft guru, Calvin Watkins. <laughs> I would say if, if, the, if those two corners are gone, I'm taking the tackle from Northwestern with Sean Slater because you got to think about the future. The starting left tackle, Tyron Smith, has been battling health issues the last two or three years. Lyle Collins, a right tackle, He's been having some health issues. Um, these guys can't play forever. He gets Slater. However, Micah Parsons, the linebacker for Penn State, a very talented player. Um, I've seen him high up on draft boards, and I've seen him in, in the <coughs> lower in the first round. Those would be the two guys that I would, I would look at. Um, I know everyone says Kyle Pitts. I don't think Pitts would be there at 10. You can look at another. Let's take receiver. Pitts out of this conversation. Take He's not going to be there. Out of the conversation. Yeah. And those, those Pitts, are the Horn, Pitts, Horn, and Sertan are all out. Yeah. I, I would take the tackle from Northwestern or my guy, Micah Pitts from Penn State. Those would be my my two guys to get at 10 if, as you said, those three other players are with somebody else. What about you, Michael? Would you agree with those two? Would you add another player that you think is on that plateau? or how do you I, v I vehemently disagree about Micah Parsons as hmm. a couple bit um i think the path to playing time isn't there enough for him i think the character concerns that are real for yeah, him one, he had he had a fight with a teammate because it was alleged bullying i don't think that's a character concern that's just there's, two there's, guys having a fight well you would not you have a fight with all of your teammates there's others, there's there's others. others. I do. yes i do it's not one like he was to me Calvin. a character <laughs> issue he was robbing banks you know, he, 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 he failed some drug tests. Having one fight with a teammate, to me, is not a character issue. But I'll you say, Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, so I, I was talking to a GM this week and about Parsons specifically. And I said, is there a lot of smoke there about character? He said, there's, there's smoke, not enough where you wouldn't draft the guy. <laughs> so you're right, Calvin. But I do think there's enough smoke there. And I do believe it was more than, more than one thing there. Um, enough smoke there where he's not a fit for this Cowboys locker room where if you're going to draft another linebacker early he needs to be a little bit more in that Sean Lee leadership type void there shouldn't be any question marks about what he brings to your locker room and I think right now the Cowboys don't have the locker room in my view or the playing time dynamic with their depth chart to support Micah Parsons not this year I mean next year in terms of linebacker I think things open up but not right now for me I would echo you the on Rashawn Slater, even though to me, the Cowboys have screamed that they're comfortable with their situation at tackle between Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins, both those players healthy, both those players had a portion of their salaries. Uh, those they became signing bonuses to accelerated uh, for cap saving purposes. You don't make those types of moves if you have any questions <clears throat> about either of them. So, um, but if those you know three players are gone that we're talking about, uh, Slater is just so versatile. Uh, you, you could throw him at your starting left guard and, and move him down the road to tackle as needed. So I, I would, uh, I'd be with you there if, if no trade back is possible. So really only Slater, you wouldn't have anyone else there that you would consider it at 10? Not really. Um, I guess, yeah, I, don't, I, I wouldn't do Sewell. Um, no, I, I would probably <coughs> just think Slater. Um, I wouldn't think that they would go corner of one of those other corners if those two are off the board. Um, they're not going linebacker in my view, maybe edge defender. I think you probably could if the Cowboys were enamored on, on one of these guys. And, um, you know, there is some fluidity. You could argue whether or not there's a guy who's clean enough to take in the top 10. You could argue that against that, but it'd be possible that the Cowboys might go for an edge rusher in that scenario. And Tim, that's to me, that's interesting because normally an edge rusher is in the conversation in the top five. 
Now, here we are at 10, and we gave a couple of different scenarios, and there's not really an edge rusher that there's a consensus where you say, well, that, that's the guy that should be there. You know, is it going to be Kitty Pay? Is it going to be one of these other guys? Be a Miami guy, Jalen Phillips? Is that too high for him? You know, what about Rousseau? I mean, it, you know, Basham. I mean, people are like all over. Well, Basham's more second round. Excuse me. You know, people are all over all over the board on this. What do you have a plateau there at ten? And does it really shackle Dallas in some ways that if they don't go corner there? Is there really any other position defensively that makes a lot of sense for them based on what the talent looks the way it's shaking down? No, uh, I agree with Michael's part about I don't I don't like the idea of drafting Parsons. I don't think there's uh, the only reason there would be playing time for him is if one of your two linebackers that you've drafted either in the first round or high in the second and already given a second contract are not playing for some reason. Because uh, you really, well, in fairness, the same applies to Slater. You know, I mean, we're talking about a couple of players. Yeah, you know, through shakes that's true. But I, but I'm okay with an offensive lineman taking till his second year to get in there, and and I don't know what options might be moving Collins back to guard someday or, or whatever it might be. I, I don't really like anybody. If both corners are going. Uh, that's unusual. I would love it if they would just screw with everybody and take Jalen Waddle and say, look, okay, we got four receivers now. We'll, and, and a bunch of people wanted him because one of those receivers would be the one of those Alabama receivers would be there and then trade any one of the four, see what you can get. That would be hysterical. Uh, I don't think they would be inclined to do that, but it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. Let's, let's end this part and let's talk specifically about Sertan and Horn. Uh, their attributes, um, what we think of them. And then after we talk about them a little bit, let's, let's go to some of the questions because I see that the cues filling up. Uh, Calvin, again, let's start with you on this because I know uh, your story in, in tomorrow's, uh, in the print edition of the morning news and already online is talking about this very point. Uh, let, you know, what are the pros and cons of Sertan versus Horn? Uh, why don't you start us off on this one? Okay. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the dudes from Alabama. Uh, Patrick Sutan, big corner, 6'2". Uh, I talked to one uh, uh, AFC uh, uh, director of scouting for AFC team. He said the great thing about Sutan is he gets the job done. He does his job. You know, he's not flashy, um, but he just gets it done. The downside to him is he did not cover every best receiver in the last two years at Alabama. That was something that he didn't like. Um, I talked to the defensive coordinator from the NFC uh, team. He didn't he like, was, or they just didn't ask him to do it? Uh, he didn't. He wasn't too specific in terms of didn't, wasn't sure if it, did they ask him to do it or, hey, you're just on this one side, so okay. you got Waddle. Or if Waddle goes on the other side, you just stay where you are. You know, it wasn't too specific. So I don't want to, you know, create something there. But everything I heard from the NFC uh, defensive coordinator and the AFC college uh, director of scouting was that this guy gets the job done. Uh, you can play man, you can play zone. You know, he, he's solid. Uh, now, the, the gentleman from South Carolina, I was told, takes a lot of risk, is more athletic, um, will get to more, more balls. <laughs> Hey, I'm gonna knock some passes down. I'm around the football a little bit more than Sertan. However, they feel like he's a little too risky. He takes too many risks. And that, as you guys know, from watching NFL games, that could be a problem. Um, it was interesting that Kyle Pitts, who we've been raving about, said to the Cowboys on a virtual call that he thought Horn was better, was the best corner he saw. And I'm gonna preface that by saying that Pitts and Horn share the same agent. So you can take that for what oh, it's okay. yeah. <laughs> So you're saying that could be a connection. Yeah, that could be a connection. Yeah, you know, connection. Yeah. Well, and Michael, I want to go to today too. And at one point of the of the press conference today, when they were talking about when we started talking to to Mike McCarthy and and Stephen Jones, what they're looking for in corners, what they're weighing. Um, 
Stephen Jones turned to McCar Mike McCarthy at one point and said, well, he's, you're always talking about, you know, forcing turnovers. We can't go more than 10 or 15 minutes in a room without you stressing the need for turnovers. <laughs> well, J.C. Horn fits that from the description you just gave. Now, I know there's more to the picture, both guys here, but what do you see in these two, Mike? How, how do you how do you distinguish the two? Um, well, I think you can't – I think both are very strong corners. Sertan is a little bit more versatile where not just man but zone. <clears throat> uh, I actually talked to Sertan last night. And he said his one weakness is probably like in short area coverage where, you know, he's got a longer frame. He needs to – he's working on like shortening his steps so he can be, you know, explosive in a short uh, closing distance. Um, but really the – weaknesses in his game I mean you can have him do zone you can have him do man uh, this is a guy who decided entering his freshman year in high school that he wanted to be <clears throat> corner like his dad and once his dad heard that they, he took him to the park and they started drilling you know started working on uh, you know man press technique you know how to you know jam a receiver and open up your hips angling at 45 degrees all that and so he's just more advanced um, technically than Horn in my book. His feel for the game, I think, is superior, and he's less inclined to get handsy and draw penalties, which counts for something. You know, it's, it's it, you know, a 25-yard play, whether it's a pass interference or a catch allowed, it all counts the same, and Horn's got some hidden yardage to him uh, when it comes to that area. At least you project that going to the next level. I'm not sure if he's going to be a ball hawk. He might be more of a Byron Jones, but Byron Jones is an offseason removed from becoming the highest paid defensive back in NFL history for a reason. So that's not a bad comp uh, if that's what the Cowboys get from him, even if the turnovers aren't necessarily going to be his bread and butter. Yeah, and we should point out the, uh, the Cowboys had no problem with Byron Jones, the player. It was Byron Jones, the salary that he commanded on the open market. And Sertan, if you want to make that comparison to Byron Jones and go, well, why did they do that? Well, he would come in much younger and much cheaper than what Byron Jones was at that stage of his career. And, and that's how the Cowboys would do. Uh, but Tim is, is someone who likes to take risks, uh, unwarranted risks yes. and gambles. How, how do you see Horn in, in Sertan? You know, I'm, rather than get into my own film study and, and, and break down all that, I'm going to be more succinct here and just point yes. out this. Um, you didn't get that, the coach's tape I emailed you? Devontae Smith. Quiet there in Plasma 4. <laughs> um, uh, Devontae Smith won the Heisman. Mac Jones won the Davey O'Brien Award. Najee Harris won the Doak Walker. Some lineman from Alabama won the lineman award. And there were people that said at the time, the only reason Patrick Sertan didn't win the Jim Thorpe Award is because they didn't want to give all the awards to Alabama guys. And so the TCU guy got it. I don't even know where he is in this draft. Is he a second or third round guy? Trevor and Boring. Whatever. Maybe first round, late first. Late, late first and second. second. Maybe. That's what yeah. we're looking at. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's obviously hard to tell with Alabama guys when you're surrounded. And that's the same question people have about Mac Jones. Playing with so much talent around him sort of applies to Sertan. I mean, he played quarterback for a team that was 20 points ahead at halftime all year. And, and as Michael said, he may not have always covered, or maybe Calvin said it. Uh, the top receiver, but I mean, I, I don't know how you could go wrong taking the son of a guy who was a really good pro bowl player for the dolphins and who was a really good player at Alabama. So, yeah. And, um, again, it's interesting to me, the element we haven't talked to here before we get into questions is, what impact will Dan Quinn have on who is selected here? Um, he's the, the defensive coordinator. He certainly has a type, a style. Uh, former defensive coordinator in Seattle. They like their corners bigger. Dallas has started going toward bigger corners when Chris Richard was here uh, for a couple of years. So they already had that template of what they like at corner. Um, you know, I read the other day where someone who has been in a room uh, with Dan Quinn uh, and this case me right now, but he said, Sertan fits the profile of what, um, you know, Dan Quinn looks for in his corners. I would argue both of these guys fit the profile of what Probably. they in the corner. 
and, and I think the impression I get from talking to people is I'm sure Dallas has a preference. Um, I think they would be happy whoever is there if only one is left. I think they feel very strongly about both. And I also like, and, and I thought this was an interesting quote from Jerry today about, uh, you know, both of these guys have fathers who played in the NFL for a long time. In fact, Mike McCarthy coached Joe Horn, the receiver, who is J.C. Horn's father. And uh, Jerry was talking about, you know, I, he's a big believer in osmosis. And just hearing Jerry say the word osmosis was, was enjoyable. But um, it's also, it, I thought he brought up a good point after that. He said, you know, we talk a lot, of, a lot of times when we're going through all these prospects of, oh, well, he's a coach's son. And that's always a positive because, well, they've been around the game. They grew up with it. They, they have a little bit of better understanding of the approach and the nuances. And when they're sitting around the kitchen table, certainly you're going to be talking about that. Uh, certainly the same is in effect when your father played in the NFL. And uh, Michael, I believe as you're saying, as you were saying, once, you know, Satan was like, I'm going to play corner. Okay, well, let's get out there and do it. Now, he had the benefit of his father actually played the position. Uh, Joe Horn didn't, but, you know, Joe Horn goes against corners. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, there's a symbiotic relationship on that on those two positions where I think uh, you, you can lend a lot to it. So I, I think with the, uh, the, his, the family history and just the talent level you have seen from both of these players and Sertan and uh, J.C. Horn, that, that Dallas is in a really good position there at number 10 because it's, it's very, very hard to see that both of those guys are going to be gone when they're on the clock. I do think they have to be careful <clears throat> careful with that idea. They did end up with Bobby Carpenter for those same reasons. <laughs> and you're right, yeah, that, it's not a universal. That doesn't work across the board. So well, let's go ahead and get to some uh, questions here. Let let's me, do it, David. Let me make sure I get in the proper cue first. You may see me put on my old man glasses here in a second, but I'll, I'll try to. I've had mine on for 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go here. Thank you, David. You're doing a great job. Oh, no. That's, that's, that's not, I'm sorry. I didn't know your mother was on the call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's go to, here's one. With Sean Lee's retirement, do we prioritize a linebacker somewhere before the fifth round, especially with Leighton Van Der Esch's injury history? Let's uh, start with Michael on this one. Well, the answer is yes and no. Uh, it has nothing to do with Sean Lee's retirement. Uh, the Cowboys elected not to resign Sean Lee. If, if they decided they wanted to resign Sean Lee, Sean Lee would probably still be a Dallas Cowboy. He'd be playing the 12th NFL season. So uh, the Cowboys decided to go in a different direction. They brought in Keanu Neal. Um, you look at the way that the depth chart looks like right now, and they need linebacker depth. And they need a guy who can play special teams, and they really can't afford to wait uh, when you look at you know, Jalen Smith, even though Jerry loves him, theoretically, there's an out that exists starting in 2022 in his contract. Leighton Van Der Esch, the Cowboys might not pick up his fifth year, $9.145 million option. So this stands to be a contract year for him. Uh, and we all know he's one injury away uh, with his next situation of, you know, you know, and I don't mean to be dramatic, but it's the truth, his career being over. Um, and, and so it's, kind of, I mean, it's a one-year contract. So the Cowboys really need to protect themselves. Uh, from a special teams component, since all three of those guys, Neil, Jalen, and Layton, don't play special teams, uh, you better have a strong support on special teams behind those three guys, and uh, they need some, some depth. So I, I think, uh, yeah, day two, uh, as early as second round, linebacker for me is a big ticket position. I think the Cowboys will seriously consider it. I think it gets done day two, be it the second round or one of their two day three, or one of their two picks in the third round. Uh, linebacker for me is paramount for the Cowboys to add this draft. Calvin, do you have some names to look for there in the uh, the second and third round that would be of interest? Well, Jabril Cox seems to be a guy that that's a possibility. Uh, me and you, David, were talking about uh, Jamin Davis from Kentucky, but I think he might be a first round guy, late first round guy. He's going up the boards. It sounds like a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. So those are the two main guys um, that I was thinking of that you get in the second round, you know, um, 
because you don't want to just <clears throat> grab a linebacker just to grab a linebacker and say, oh, we're going to make him play special teams and hope that he can replace Lathan or, or, or Jalen if, if, if those two guys are not with you in 2022. So, but um, if you can't get a guy who you think can start at that position, say, in, in the 2022 season, then you know what? Find something else in the second round, in the third round. Then on Saturday, mess around with – we'll find a linebacker and see what happens. Yeah, but Baron Browning maybe in the in the third. Ohio State, round, yeah, and, uh, yeah. To keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a guy – yeah. You know, they were, at the, they were at Ohio State's pro day as they were as, – as every team was. And I asked someone, I said, did you do a virtual with him? And I got no response. Doesn't necessarily mean they didn't do a virtual, but I'm sure they talked to him in Columbus when they were up there. And you were saying too, you know, going into the third day, I think, I think the board starts filling up quite a bit from what I've I've seen (laughs) in the fourth round with linebackers. So they didn't take one. Second round to me is interesting, but if they, I would think third is more likely with the two picks there in the third. I, I'd be surprised if they didn't come out of linebacker there. Uh, Tim, let's give you something else. Not that you don't love talking about linebackers, but but no, it, lo- it looked like you had a a germane point to raise. So please, I had a hand up. I was just going to add to what Michael said. You could even t- he said by the end of the third round they'll have made four picks. Mm-hmm. I was going to say by the end of the fourth round they'll have made six, barring a trade. And it's okay if it's one of those because if Linebackers, you, you can usually find pretty good linebackers, as long as you're not looking for outside linebackers, pass rushing guys. If you're looking for guys who can play the position and play some special teams, you can probably get that in the fourth round somewhere and, and, and you know, work that into your needs. Tim, here, here's a question from you, and this is, this is a guy we have oh, good. discussed, but it's fascinating because to me four weeks ago, he was actually in the conversation with Patrick Sertan about whether or not the Cowboys would take him at 10 and how much the Cowboys uh, liked his ceiling and what he could do, Caleb Farley. So the question is, is it worth the risk of drafting Caleb Farley in the late first or early second round? You know the Cowboys think it's worth it in the early second because that's where they do it. Um, (laughs) Probably in the late first. Although, I mean, you, you probably, the problem with him is the problem with everybody. And it's been talked about, not here tonight so much, but uh, not having normal medical procedures, teams are, are leery of, of more leery than they usually are. The Cowboys, hell, they, they did the surgery on Jalen Smith. They knew everything about him. This year, they're like everybody else. They're in the dark on a lot of these guys. And J.C. Horn has had a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Caleb Farley's had a lot of stuff to uh, to consider. So I would lean toward no at any point in the first round just because you're really guessing more than you, you would be in any other year. And Michael, with two, I believe it's two micro dissectomies now that, that Farley has had, um, opted out last year. You know, he missed the last two games of the last season he played, including the bowl game with the back issue, uh, had it corrected, opted out, and then had another micro dissectomy here. Would you consider him in the second or, and we haven't talked about this much, but you know, we focused on the, on the corners that could be there at 10 or should be there at 10. It's a very deep cornerback class and, and second round corners, even when the Cowboys pick at 44, there should be several on the board that are, that are worthy. Do you think that hurts Farley? Do you think that's likely to knock him down a little bit more given his medical condition? Or is that about the range where the return on investment, the potential return on investment is so high, you say, no, we've got to do it. I think it's incredibly difficult for a team to take Farley in the first round. At least attending the draft in Cleveland, which could turn out to be a very poor decision by his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, if that's the case. I could be misinformed. Um, but it's what it's like there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a just a influx of various factors there that together I don't think you touch them uh, in the first round and I think even then in the second if there's a guy who's cleaner uh, who you've actually seen fo- play football since 2019 um, you know I think you I, I don't know how you take Farley um, I think you need to be a little more risk averse even if the Cowboys 
history tells you otherwise, I mean, you're taking a chance on this guy because of what you see on film, which is this incredibly physically gifted corner. But if the number one concern with him smashes in the face of his number one strength, so what are you really getting in the second round? I, I understand that, you know, it's day two and you can take some chances, but day two picks matter. A second round pick matters. And there are going to be a lot of quality players on that board. Uh, so to take, it's a roll of dice there. I'd rather just, pack up at corner, or probably I would either draft a different corner or pack it up and sign Casey Hayward in for agency, if that's me. Alvin, agree with Michael there, are you going to attack him like you did last time you expressed an opinion? No, I, I, I agree with Michael to a certain um, point. Um, you, know, we, you know, we're used to guys getting back in uh, surgeries with Tony Romo, and but Tony was in his 30s. And, you know, Farley is what, 20, 221. Uh, now his agent says he'll be back for training camp in July. It's not a big deal. Um, well, I think he's, I'm not picking him at 10. I do believe he will get drafted in the first round, probably late, maybe early second round. Um, now Drew Rosenhaus has said this, so I don't know if he's lying or not, but I, I think someone's going to take a chance on Farley. And one thing I will add is while the Cowboys have always traditionally been a team that will take chances on injured players. It was interesting today that Jerry Jones said that's the number one shortcoming of this draft is the lack of complete medical information on a lot of these guys who are coming off health issues like Farley, Landon Dickerson in Alabama and so forth. And, that, and that's a good point before we segue into the next question. Jerry said that today and he said it's, it's the biggest issue in this draft in his mind, not getting the staffs not being able to get their arms around the medical. So to me, it's going to be very interesting if at number 44, Farley is there. Jerry is also, has already expressed an issue about the medicals. He also said today that he is less inclined to take with some, take a player who opted out of their last season because of COVID returns, because you have the, now you're talking about taking someone who hadn't played football in 14 months uh, so put those two together, that's kind of like a double whammy on Farley. So if he's sitting there at number 44, uh, it's going to be very interesting how the Cowboys, who have traditionally taken risks in the second round, view that. Uh, another question here. Do you believe Jerry Jones is hung up on getting top offensive players, thus leaving holes in the defense? I will start by answering yes. Yes, yes. Um, just to give you an example, they, in the last 14 drafts, uh, the last 14 years, there have been 14 first-round picks. So it breaks along offensive and defensive lines. It's seven and seven. So you can say, well, there's no offensive bias there whatsoever. But then look at how many of those players actually receive a long-term second contract from the club Five of the offensive players, none of the defensive players. The only guy who actually got beyond his rookie <clears throat> deal was Anthony Spencer, who they franchised in two consecutive years and then signed to a one-year deal. Um, Mo Claiborne signed a one-year deal, but that was after they refused to pick up the fifth-year option. So it came to the same length. So this, this club has a clear offensive bias, and, and I think it's going to be fascinating in this draft because they really need to change their defensive trajectory. And every organization has a bias, and, and the Cowboys' bias, I would say not just their inclination, but also their personnel expertise is more evident on the offensive side of the ball uh, when you go through the picks they've made in recent years. Tim, I know you want to agree with me on this. Well, in that exhaustive answer, I wanted to ask you first, <laughs> in your seven offenses and seven defenses, did you count Amari Cooper as a first-round pick yeah. on offense? Did not. Because if you know, then it's 8-7 because that's they traded, yeah. They essentially used a first-round pick on him. And I, I would go, instead of picks, just, just look at where they rank, offensive line spending, running back spending, quarterback spending, receiver spending. And then go look at where they rank in the secondary, and you you can tell where the priority is. And I'm I'm not really saying that's wrong, 
And to the questioner's point, I mean, I think Jerry feels like he won three Super Bowls with Troy Emmett and Michael and a supporting defense. Now, we know the 92 defense was ranked number one in the league that year. And that could be because Emmett and Troy and Emmett were all so good and they had a lead and all those things that factor into that. But they won the first one with offensive stars. And, and in addition to the fact that those people sell tickets and jerseys and everything else, he feels like that's, if you got to have a shortcoming somewhere, do it on defense and make up for it with hustle and a good defensive coordinator. And that's, that's been the theory for 20 some years. It, it hasn't got him a Super Bowl, but I don't know that that's the biggest flaw in his philosophy. Yeah, and you, you mentioned Amari Cooper. You know, they signed him last year to a five-year, $100 million deal. They really gave no consideration to bringing Byron Jones back, even though he was, he was you know, an $82 million deal. And yeah. to me, that's just – and I, I only went back 14 years, but I think only once in the last 14 years has defense – have they spent more money on the defensive side of the ball uh, than the offensive side of the ball? And that was within like two or three million. Usually uh, you have them spending anywhere from 17 to 30 million more on the offensive side of the ball uh, than you do on defense. I will say very quick, you know, this is not a, a blanket indictment of them though, because I really truly believe every organization is better on one side of the ball than the other. And for the most part, and I'll give you an example real quick. Everyone loves what Baltimore does. They have a defensive identity. I think a lot of people, you know, for years here, people were saying, oh, if only the Cowboys did a better job in the draft room like Baltimore does. Well, they've taken 31 wide receivers. They have not had a wide receiver that they drafted gain more than 950 yards. They haven't had a wide receiver they've drafted have more than 65 interceptions in a, receptions in a season. So the formula works both ways. I, I think, it, you know, I think, but a club hires along the lines of what it wants its culture to be and what its emphasis is. And, and I think you see that with Dallas, just like you see it with Baltimore and some other clubs. Um, let's get to a few more questions here. Um, aside from the number 10 pick, so let's take that off the board for a second. What are the positions the Cowboys should target in the later rounds of the draft? Michael, if you can start us off on this one. Sure. Well, let's just say later after the first round, let's we'll work our after way. After the first. Right. Um, linebacker, which we've discussed already. Uh, I think sneaky need is interior offensive line. Uh, there's a reason why the Cowboys have not resigned Joe Looney yet. He remains to be a free agent because they want to go through this draft and potentially – select an interior offensive lineman uh, to pair up with Tyler Biotic. Uh, so I think that is a, certainly a spot. Um, edge defender depth is, is, a, is, is a need. Uh, having part, you know, last offseason, the Cowboys acquired Alden Smith. They acquired uh, the pass rusher, uh, Ever, Everson Griffin, who they ended up trading midseason to the Lions. Um, you know, they have, you know, they've done some things with, you know, adding Basham from the Jets, but um, I, it still seems like there's more to be done, um, you know, between Basham and the return of, of, of Grainer Gregory for a full season, still more to be done. So you could have some depth there. Um, really weak defensive tackle drafts. I don't know if you force that. The Cowboys have done a lot or enough in for agency not to press that issue. Um, could see a quarterback in maybe sixth, seventh round. I think late day three, uh, the Cowboys could develop a quarterback. Uh, that would certainly be an option, something Mike McCarthy said he wants to add. Uh, he said today he wants to add some competition to the quarterback room, the backup spot behind Dak Prescott. Um, I had someone told me they thought running back. Oh, I'm not totally uh, sure about that one. Perhaps tight end, but Cowboys should feel really good about where they stand in tight end. I think those are probably, I may be missing some, but those are to me are some of the most pressing roster needs for the Cowboys. I mean, safety, I, I don't want to overlook that. Safety, I think it's really afford to have more depth across every level of their defense. Uh, this will come to no surprise as Tim, who I've done a radio show with for a few weeks, but I have us behind schedule here. So we need to go in the lightning round here very quickly before we get to our mock. Um, Calvin, if the corners don't get a corner at number 10, uh, they could find one later in the draft. And where is that talent? Who, let's say second round. Who, who are some of the second round corners that, that uh, people should keep in mind there? Uh, kids, Greg Newsom, the second, 
he's a guy who might go late first round, early second round. Stokes out of Georgia, that's another kid that, that might be a second round guy. Uh, there's a kid at Syracuse. His his name doesn't escape me. I just can't pronounce it, but he's very talented. Cowboys had a virtual meeting with him. Uh, they also had a virtual meeting with another former uh, NFL player's son, Ashante Samuel Jr. So those are those are guys that could be second round guys. And as you said earlier, cornerback is pretty deep in in this draft. So if you miss out on the top two guys, you got a chance to to, to get a good guy in the second round. Tim, in 10 seconds or left, is Sertan overrated because he is playing in the Alabama machine? Uh, well, we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, I think I think that was some – you could make that case with Mo Claiborne playing on a great LSU team and on a great LSU defense. Maybe he looked a little better than he was, but I would suspect that's not a big worry. Uh, Michael, real quick. What is a reason the Cowboys wouldn't draft Sertan at 10 overall? They thought Horn was better. Um, or if they felt like there was value to be had in the second round at corner, some of those options that Calvin mentioned, they felt really good about that and thought, you know what? We have this cluster of cornerbacks in, this, in day two that we really like. And if we miss out on them, there's a free agent we haven't signed that, you know, we, we like him enough and, and think that it would give us a veteran presence opposite Trayvon Diggs and we think that we can get by that way so uh, those would be the that would be the rationale I'm not saying it's what the Cowboys believe but that would have to be their thinking uh, to me to pass up on a corner round one Calvin seven seconds or less and then we're going to our mock draft which everyone has been awaiting eagerly to, to, the needles. to say on this um, do you think they will take another quarterback late in this draft as a project or do you think it's more likely they they add another quarterback through free agency. As long as it's not Gucci Danucci, I'm okay with them taking a quarterback. I got a, a mock draft, seven round mock draft coming out. I had them taking Notre Dame's Ian Book late in the in the draft. So nice. after a quarterback. I have one quick question. Tim would Calvin. say book it. Or is that what you're gonna say, Tim? <laughs> nice. Nice. I have a quick question for Calvin. Michael would know this too, but there's an obvious reason I'm asking Calvin, are there any SMU Mustangs in this draft? Are there any Hilltoppers? Shane Bouchel. Well, I know. <laughs> I know he's a late, real late pick probably. Uh, in terms of the first day, I would say no. In terms of the second, second day, day, I would, sir? Second day, maybe? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Just one. I won't, I won't put any money on it, but you know, okay. what it is. Let's start our mock now. We may run mm. uh, just a few minutes over, not too long over if we do. So I got, my, I got my book. I'm ready. Us, we appreciate it. Uh, go to my notes. Uh, to notes. I will go with uh, <laughs> Trevor Lawrence. Good pick. Oh, man. Shocking, I know. The Jaguars. What do you like better about him? <laughs> I like the fact that now we move to number two in the New York Jets and Calvin. Uh, the New York Jets select Zach Wilson, quarterback, Brigham Young University. Nice. Michael, San Francisco, where the intrigue begins. Ooh. <laughs> I'm going quarterback. I've done a lot of research on this, a lot of virtual calls with all the prospects that are available. I'm going to go with Mac Jones out of Alabama. I really like the kid's smarts. I've been watching 500 hours of film over the past two days, and he's just really impressive. <laughs> Tim, not to be outdone, I know you do your film, Atlanta at number four. Let's talk a little about the history of the Atlanta Falcons. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> they could obviously trade this pick, but even if they did trade this pick, it might not be for a quarterback, and it could be for this guy. They should take him. His name is Kyle Pitts. He plays tight end from Florida. Now that leaves me at Cincinnati at number five. You do not have fields there. Uh, I do not believe Cincinnati is going to go that route. <laughs> you know, the question here is, and, and to me, this is, there are two clear paths here. Do you go offensive line to protect the quarterback that you invested in last year, or do you get him possibly the receiver that he showed a rapport with? I think there's an easy answer. You do. I would go offensive line. I'm going through. Whoa. Whoa. I would too. And I think they should. Wow. I no, can not having the line. And, got the then I, I don't care what Michael and Calvin think. If Tim agrees with me, 
But you, not having a line killed their quarterback. I think you both know that too. So Calvin, that goes Miami at number six, and you unexpectedly have Fields there, I would say, or maybe not unexpectedly. Yeah, uh, it's good to see him there, but I'm going to take the LSU wide receiver, Jamar Chase, who's considered the best receiver in this draft. So I'm taking a wide out to go with Tua. Now let's go to Michael and Detroit. Well, if I'm Detroit, I just traded for Jared Goff, which is to say that I need a quarterback. So I'm going to go with Trey Lance, quarterback out of North Dakota State. Wow. Yeah. So you're going yeah. quarterback there, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't know how you're sold on Jared Goff. It's the Chargers can draft Philip Rivers with Drew Brees on the roster. I think you can draft Trey Lance with Jared Goff on yours. Tim, does this throw a wrench in your plans with Carolina at number eight? No, because they have to protect young Sam Darnold in his uh, second kick of the can here. <laughs> so they're going to take Rashawn Slater, the tackle from Northwestern, uh, to protect Mr. Darnold. I did not see it going this way. Now at Denver at number nine, um, you have a quarterback available. You have two corners. You have your second receiver available as well. Linebacker. And linebacker. But I think Denver would be euphoric here and would go with fields, which would give you five quarterbacks in the first nine picks, which brings us to Dallas, which leaves no defensive players taken. Pitt's gone. So let's go around the board, and Tim will get upset if we don't start with him since he considers himself the alpha dog. So, Tim, at number 10, who do the Cowboys select? Okay, I'll be quick this time because uh, we've talked about this at length. I think Patrick Sertan has been their pick. I mean, it hasn't. I don't know who's been their pick. It's been the logical pick for them for the two or three months. We've been – people have been doing mock drafts. Uh, you can't go wrong with having two Alabama corners – Leading your secondary, takes her tan. Don't think about anything else. Michael? I concur. I'll keep it brief. We spent a lot of time talking about Sir Tan, but he would be my pick. I mean, I haven't done the research the Cowboys have, but with the information we have of the team's roster, its needs, and the pro quality of prospect it appears to be, uh, I, I go Sir Tan. Calvin? I have breaking news. The, the Cowboys coaches and scouts, they like Patrick Sertan. And they like J.C. Horn. I just want to let everybody know that. Um, <laughs> breaking news here. But I got them taking Patrick Sertan at number 10. Intriguing. David? Horn, his attitude. Um, he certainly fits taking some risks. But I don't see how you wouldn't go Sertan there. Him and Diggs have played together, which helps, uh, you know, this, this organization really likes Diggs, and I don't think there's any question that Sertan is, is higher rated. I mean, Alabama looked at it. Right. Right. Um, they would here, too. You're, you're putting them back together. This is a guy that you feel better about than Diggs, and you were very impressed with what he brought you. So I, I believe this has a chance of being the, the rare case where the, the player people were focused on five, six weeks ago there's a good chance he will actually be there. And, and as Michael wrote earlier this week, uh, can you tell us that, Michael, the last time a, a defensive player did not go off the board until number 10 was? The 1957? I'm trying to think back. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. And there's a Cowboys connection. He wasn't drafted by the Cowboys, but it was Jerry Tubbs. who yeah, Cowboys didn't the, exist back then. For the club and then right. the assistant coach. So... Well, that, that does it for us here this evening, other than the test. Many of you really wanted and hung on for this long was for <laughs> Calvin to announce who gets the autographed jersey. Give him the shirt. And if his internet drops off, we will, we will make sure that uh, one of the others of us will announce that. But Calvin, uh, if, you, if you can do the drum roll on, on your Mac there and, and let us know who the winner of the jersey is. All right, um, let me see here. Let me check my phone. Hold on one second. 
Make sure I got it right. You didn't get an envelope from uh no, I wrote it down somewhere. I'm trying to find oh, it. Uh, wait a minute. It is Joey Hayden. He is our winner of the uh, Dak Prescott jersey, and we will email you promptly to let you know how we can get your address and all those good things. Quarterback Joe Hayden. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Hayden, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations, Joey. That, Joe, Joey Hayden. That name sounds familiar. <laughs> well, again, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us on the call this evening. I want to uh, give at least a minimal thanks to my other panelists, uh, Tim, Michael, and Calvin, or Calvin, Michael, and Tim, or Michael, Tim, and Calvin, however you want to do it. Uh, do you guys have anything else to say to our loyal uh, subscribers as we end this show this evening? Thank you. Thanks to everybody for joining us. I thought tonight was the night that David Moore became the MC of this staff. And I think that was important to be a part of. I think David Moore didn't move up in my eyes. He really, he's been a great mentor to me, as you have been seen. And I think David has surpassed you in the mentorship program. He's got great lighting there. Oh, my gosh. A nice background. He's got I the media guides. Avoid. <laughs> Just show you I'm serious about these things. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank everybody so much for joining us this evening. I know you have other options on how to spend your early evenings. Uh, we appreciate you doing it with us and uh, had a lot of fun. And hopefully we can do something like this uh, along these lines uh, very soon again. Thank everybody so much. And good night.